I became aware of Christchurch's free theatre when I saw their production of Distraction Camp. Their approach was very physical, mixing music, colour and startling images, and they raised disturbing questions. It was the most intense drama I'd seen for a long time, and I was amazed to learn that they'd been creating experimental theatre for more than three decades. Their inspiration for this production was Jean Genet's The Balcony, set in a bordello, the house of illusions. <laughs> Distraction Camp was engaging with the sense that in contemporary society things feel empty and sort of meaningless. Working with Genet's The Balcony and actually really try to not offer a moral, we never do, but actually offer a, a, a question or a, a provocation that would um, engage the audience with the same questions that we're asking. Some of the text that I intro introduced into it, text by Michael Laws and other politicians and so on, was in a way showing that it was quite relevant to New Zealand society. What else did you steal? Cheese, because I was hungry. Oh, sublime. Sublime function. You could argue sometimes that people are living a so horrific life, not living up to their real potential, that they are distracted by so many entertainment things when they're not at work, and that they don't really uh, feel awake completely. And I think theatre would be one place where people can wake up and experience things again. Smile, smile, smile at your rider. Recognize his hand. Gentle. Peter likes to incorporate our skills into the productions because he knows that's something we're passionate about and something we can contribute. And most productions I've been involved in have had some sort of musical component and usually some sort of singing I can do, like whether it's belly dancing and singing Mozart or singing Schumann hanging upside down from my knees or, or singing tango, which was amazing to be able to sing that sort of music. It's, it's really opened up my own musical perspectives. Any elation the group might have felt from the success of their Distraction Camp production was suddenly shattered by the first of the Christchurch earthquakes on September the 4th. The second earthquake in February 2011 destroyed their theatre in the historic arts centre. After the earthquake, I think uh, free theatre has become uh, much more engaged with trying to use the crisis that has been created through the destruction of the earthquake to create something which is more alive, but will keep young people in town rather than let them flee a uh, town that is so destroyed. Make the earthquake as something, as awful as it is, as something productive. All the structures, not just physical, um, but social, just kind of collapsed. People weren't worrying about having to go to work or the, the everyday worries and cares. Um, all they were concerned about was really actually helping each other. The idea was to try to bring that into a production very quickly. 
Free Theatre's response to the earthquake was the production of Earthquake in Chile, loosely based on an early 19th century tale by Heinrich von Kleist about a scandalous love affair involving a priest, a baby born out of wedlock, and an attempted suicide by hanging, thwarted by an earthquake. The new thing is uh, that we work together with an artist from Wales, from a Baristwith, who uh, is quite well known in Europe for his uh, productions with food. That's why I chose the story by Kleist, where a kind of meal together after an earthquake is seen as a kind of paradisical thing. The collaboration really was to see how we could take an audience who begin really as a group of individuals through a series of encounters, uh, through an expedition that formed small groups and then larger groups and then finally one long table uh, of a community sharing stories and feeding each other. Followers of San Precario, guide these precarious people on our precarious land. Take them to the tented village. <laughs> After the earthquake and the drama, the audience is led out of the church, where they take part in a series of unusual food events. Congratulations, man. <laughs> in the tented village part of, of the earthquake in Chile, I am involved with Ryan in a small scene that tells of our memories, our actual memories of restaurants in Christchurch. And that's made a number of people cry each evening. And now, I, I suspected that it would be quite ev evocative and quite a powerful or intimate scene, but I didn't imagine that we would make people cry. And I think this production asks the audience to reconnect with that time of the first week after the earthquake when, you know, time didn't matter and, and none of your other responsibilities that you normally had mattered because you were focused on looking after people or finding water or just dealing with a sort of survival situation. Through this production, people, I think, are reconnecting with that. Next course! Next course! Now! Next course. Give your ribbons a wee oh, call, write your name and your comfort food, and we'll get the orders up. I'll leave the potato wing. Please, Jeff, orders up! Rich pork chocolate, hot chocolate pudding! When I came along, I had no idea what to expect, and it turned out to be an unforgettable experience. Then we came outside and we found that we were as much part of the, the players as the young people who were doing it. Having had this sort of chaotic, um, anarchic almost, uh, game around the bell tower, we then invite the audience to, to move to what we call the long table. Hi, guys, we've got some spacings down here. Before we eat and drink, is just write a memory that you have of food that you ate soon after one of the quakes. Well, one of the things I particularly remember when about 90 of us were spread along a long tent and we had to feed each other and it was about being together in the aftermath of the earthquake. We started out in the church, we finished in the church. In between, we had been exposed to a whole range of experiences. We had had to work with and listen to and deal with other people in the audience. We came back with a very comfortable feeling and were immediately jolted out of it again by the final act of the play. It was just a tremendous night and I wished it could have gone on and on. The name Free Theatre uh, obviously has a, a, a tradition, a European tradition, going back to Théâtre Libre in France and the Freie Bühne in Germany. These were theatres that were not celebrating the state and also not state-subsidised either. They were critical of the society of their times. And in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a, a movement, a free theatre movement in Europe, uh, which sort of uh, der derived from this tradition, uh, which tried to really sort of um, revolutionise the theatre scene. 
My training was in the Kammerspiel in Munich, which is a well-known theater in, in Europe. And Brecht, for example, started off there. And then there was this student revolution and all that stuff. And there was a big revolution of sense around the things. But that died of in, the, in the middle 70s. And that's the time when I came to New Zealand. I thought that the theater scene was incredibly conservative and a, a throwback in a way. But then the British theater scene always was much more conservative than the European. The kind of talking heads theater that uh, we had tried to get rid of as, as young theater makers in Europe, especially the, the kind of free theaters that they were sort of uh, propping up all over the place uh, in the late 60s, early 70s in Europe. Uh, the very much fit, more physical theater, theater that was um, uh, not so much text-based, but event-based. Right through the 1970s, really, there were a number of companies which did quite radical and experimental work. Amamis Theatre Company, Living Theatre Troupe in Auckland, Theatre Action, which was in Auckland and in Wellington, and Blurter, of course, which was kind of half theatre and half music. And then later there was Red Mole, and there were another number of other, you know, companies as well through that time. It's interesting that by the late 70s, the companies had either gone overseas, like Red Mole was in New York, or they'd broken up, and the various members, I mean, many of them went on to do interesting work in different ways. But, I, you know, by the time that Peter Falkenberg um, arrived in Christchurch in the late 70s and started with Free Theatre in 1979, really... Um, you know, he encountered what was really a, the kind of most conservative and English theatre model of, of theatre that was operating in New Zealand. Certainly its golden age, if you like, was in the 1930s and 40s when people like Rita Angus and Leo Benzman, Alan Kurnow, Dennis Glover, Nio Marsh, Douglas Auburn were all living in the city and uh, doing great things and doing great things together. When I returned to Christchurch, things had moved on, of course, in various areas. Uh, but, the, but I was very conscious of the Anglo-centric aspect of the city's cultural life, which I felt impatient with and wanted to try and pit myself against. Uh, in theatre, for example, the court theatre was had become well established. It had been started by Mervyn Thompson and had been quite a progressive institution in its early days, but I think it had settled into a more conservative mode by the end of the 70s. And I'm sure that um, when Peter Falkenberg set up the free theatre, um, he would, would have been very conscious of that Anglo-centric, conservative, rather conventional kind of approach to theatre. When free theatre began, it was part of a new, youthful underground culture. Christchurch and Dunedin became the centre of a great burst of alternative music, sparked by the energy of punk. Punk chose to provoke and confront the audience because it felt that music had fossilised. Christchurch was conservative, but there were lots of really interesting things that were going on and a lot of my friends were involved in the music scene, and that was a really um, dynamic music scene. And one of the people that um, I worked a lot with in the free theatre was a guy called Roy Montgomery, and he was part of the Pin Group, which was the first group that Flying Nun recorded, and then he went on to The Shallows. Charles Haywood, who was in the free theatre, was in a band called The World with Bill Doreen. And, you know, so there was a, a really a lot of crossover um, amongst the different kind of cultural scenes that were going on. Peter uh, was trying to embody, uh, you know, some of the major developments that had happened in European theatre since the Dadaists. So there was a bit of catching up to do as well, but, and yet he couldn't fail in, 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 in encouraging uh, involvement with people who ha whose only uh, experience had been with university theatre and these sort of Nao Marsh and, and the court theatre. And yet, those things themselves were also breakthroughs in their own way. Our patron saint was King Ubu, uh, Ubu Roi. When we had our first production in the arts centre, in our new theatre, which we sort of built ourselves, we actually started it with King Ubu, a kind of forerunner of Dada, surrealism, all these things that are mixed up and shook up 
the conventional theater in Europe, and I thought that was 100 years ago, sure, but uh, I think New Zealand needs it. With Ubu, for example, uh, the first word is Merdra. I think his materialization of this was to put me on, the, on a toilet and uh, was interested in having me try to pass a motion on the stage in the, in the first few moments of the play. And this would be, well, okay, this is fine, but... And um, because I was also I was very interested in some forms of theatre that, that, that did this kind of thing. Um, but I wasn't interested in doing them, doing, doing them myself. And then, of course, we took the classic King Lear, which is a sacred cow in English theatre, and decided to take it apart and put it back together again. Those two productions uh, established us on the uh, Christchurch stage. I do recall vividly King Lear with Robin Bond as, as a naked Lear. I, I felt that that was a uh, very visceral, uh, powerful, very engaging and uh, the, the best work of theirs that I saw in that period. And then we did a performance at the Jazz Cellar which used some texts from Tristan Zara actually, I think, uh, and from others of the Dadaists and Surrealists. For example, one was the morality of idiots. We staggered the voices so that every person began quite mathematically a syllable after the other, so the morality of idiots and their belief in genius makes me puke. So um, this all sort of gained momentum like a sort of a, a frog's chorus. We did a public production of Wojtzeck and then uh, Peter Falkenberg suggested that we do a uh, groundbreaking production of Schnitzler's Round Dance, which was about to beat the copyright, a 50-year ban on its copyright for being a salacious, sexual, nasty piece of work from the Viennese writer Arthur Schnitzler. Um, so we did that um, and achieved notoriety at the Southern Ballet Theatre. If you look at the, the play where it's sort of, you know, people sleeping with the, it's like a daisy chain of sex. So I thought that this photograph was to be taken for, for publicity purposes. It was one of the Sunday newspapers. So I had nothing on except a pair of very brief knickers. And uh, unfortunately it was in a national newspaper, I, you know. So my poor dad, he rang me up and had a real go at me about appearing on page two, semi-nude. Oh my God, you know what? risks I took and things, but it, that's, that was part of it. That was part of this whole, you know, little bit of Berlin in the middle of Christchurch where there was that all sorts of kind of wild behaviour and, and um, what, we'd have wild parties and, you know, we were, we were actors, we were artists. In the first instance, uh, when Peter and I and Patrick Evans and so on started off the free theatre, there was a certain amount of opposition, not to say hostility, from the Christchurch establishment, partly because I think Peter was German and he had radical ideas about the theatre. The attitude of the mainstream theatre was that Peter and I and our, our colleagues were a moral, really corrosive influence. Uh, my wife, Deirdre, was told that she shouldn't allow her daughter Elizabeth anywhere near the terrible Falkenberg and Bond because they were corrupt and immoral and so on and would take advantage of her sexually and all that sort of bullshit, really. Originally, we took a prime position in the Arts Centre and at that time, the Arts Centre of Christchurch was finding its position as a, uh, a tourist venue, as an arts venue. We were seen as uh, antisocial, uh, noisy, annoying, and we'd organise various events, which, you know, I think just clashed directly with the sort of middle-class vision of art which Christchurch seemed to be satisfied with at the time and we did see it as a commercially based theatre that was going on all around us and we wanted to provide an alternative to that. The court theatre activated the uh, arts centre governing body to get rid of us because there were flats above the free theatre and the people in the flats complained about the noise that we made 
And so a court case was brought to evictors, which we fought against. And one of the clinching details was that we were thought of as a drunken rabble. And the, they were reported that it was a huge pile of bottles of alcohol found outside our theatre. And we were accused of holding drunken parties. And in actual fact, it was said in court as evidence that they belonged to the Christchurch Architects Institute, <laughs> which was a hoot. And well, the long and the short of it was that we won. Ultimately, it was a, an upsetting you know, episode because we really wanted to get on with the business of theatre and we were still busy fighting against, uh, shall we say, conservative forces within the community, which were openly really trying to get rid of us. You know, I keep on having to remind myself that was really very unusual type of theatre for the context. So the other group that was working on a professional basis, obviously, was the court theatre. And, you know, we were so far removed from what the court theatre was doing that it was very exciting for younger people. And so we had a very strong, a very passionate following. We actually have never been afraid of not having audiences. The only problem that we had was to pay our actors. That was easy at first in the 70s, early 80s, by PP schemes, work skills development schemes. But then obviously those were all cut off. And then what we did instead was to found a department at the university, the Department of Theatre Film Studies, and then had a chance to train young people as students and who then worked in the theatre. So this was a change and it's something which made us survive uh, and pay the rent uh, for our theatres. The court theatre was, uh, you know, very well respected, it still is, very well established um, theatre and in those days was under the guidance of Elric Hooper. And Elric Hooper was a, a wonderful director but very conservative and sort of perform, you know, he would produce the, the classics and the occasional New Zealand production. Whereas Peter was right out, you know, on the on the um, on the extreme kind of fringe, uh, experimental, you know, Grotowski, theatre laboratory, theatre of the absurd, all these things that were running through his head and what he was wanting to explore. That's another reason why it is so amazing that it it has lasted as long as it has, and and why it's such an extraordinary achievement, and and also a kind of wonderful treasure for the for Christchurch. There was a really strong tradition of European experimental theatre, which sometimes surfaced in New Zealand in different ways, intermittently, I suppose you'd say. But it kind of wasn't the core thing. Um, so bringing it to New Zealand uh, was really important. And I, mean, I suppose, the, to me, the heart of it is to do with that relationship with the audience. So the audience, I suppose, goes to the theatre often expecting a set normal, <laughs> standardised um, experience in the theatre. Whereas the experimental tradition has tried to disrupt that experience in some way or other. And I'm standing and stretching. Take your time by me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. In 1984, we did a production of 1984, the novel by Orwell, where we had the theatre turned into the Ministry of Fear and audiences were queuing up and were then processed and interrogated and photographed and filmed. Come forward, stand on the white line. A bit of patriotism there. Name? Eight. Hands by sides, please. Occupation? You're required to answer it. The approach that Peter took of being quite confrontational and, and really involving the audience um, as kind of an additional actor, if you like, in the whole production, um, kind of challenged people, but also kind of excited them at the same time. We had huge crowds. We extended the season by a week or two from memory. Um, and we had um, people queuing to get in the door. We had a few plants in the audience as well who were kind of would start to heckle us and you know, make claims that we were being heavy-handed and totalitarian, which we were. Um, and some people kind of responded to that. The audience were not allowed into the theatre in under their own steam and under their own conditions, and they were separated from their friends completely. Um, they were vetted at the door, they were stamped, they were fingerprinted, they were blinded, they were um, 
um, interviewed in the dark, and then they were forced through tunnels to sit at various points in the theatre, and if they moved or tried to move, they would be attacked by uh, police, you know, very heavily. I remember one particular night, um, there were two men wanting to get into the, in through the door. They were separated. One of them objected, and the guard literally threw him down the stairs. <laughs> Another occasion, um, a fight was started by the actors on the stage, and two men in the audience joined the fight, and it was a real fight on stage. And then the, the police, uh, other actors, had to come in and separate that fight and then throw the audience's mem audience members out of the theatre. I mean, this is where it gets hairy, you know? It's just getting into that, that hinterland between reality and theatre. And we experimented with that a lot. I felt that theatre has to be something where an event takes place that directly talks to and engages with the audience, taking the audience seriously, not just as fodder for an entertainment industry. And so I think uh, provocation and confrontation in that sense is something which is done out of love. Central to it all was this, how does the audience take part in the show? And how can that be done in a way which would make the theatre fresh again and give people a chance? Like we say, representation or representation, people to see again, because that's what representation is. It's a chance for a double look. And if the theatre has been very set in its ways, then the double look disappears. We just become blind and repetitive, and that's all. Brecht is obviously a, a big influence, and um, also not just in his formal, but also in his uh, political uh, ideas, you know, to, to uh, uh, look at a society um, and to see the social theatre that they play, you know. I remember the, the whole process of Mahagoni and being introduced to Brecht as a politi political theatre. It just was something that absolutely wowed me. I'd never come across any ideas like it or any experience like it, and it just captured my imagination. And the way Peter directed wasn't always what I... I struggled sometimes with what he was asking um, because I was quite shy on one, on, on one personal level and I found that quite challenging. But the ideas and his innovation were, were really exciting. Peter Falkenberg, who was, um, uh, uh, you know, a very exotic, very charismatic creature with his black beard and his black, black hair and very passionate and very unafraid to sort of say and do things that perhaps a lot of New Zealanders in the theatre scene in those days weren't doing. I mean, I had never known a German person before I met Peter. I think I was born about 14, 15 years or something after the end of the Second World War. Well, that's not all that long, really. So my generation still had uncles, grandfathers, whatever, who had fought in the Second World War. So Peter and I remember meeting a German in this very European city in the middle of New Zealand, uh, who, who he, I remember him telling me a story about an uncle of his who had fought in the war and come back to Munich and had just locked himself in the attic and basically stayed there. So that was another sort of area of kind of my education to actually meet and grow to respect a German for the first time. Peter saw himself very much as a, as a Fassbender kind of a character, you know, the film director who really had a troupe of actors that he worked with consistently. I remember Peter lent me a, a biography of Fassbender and I remember vividly one passage where um, Fassbinder had humiliated one of his actors who appears in Quarrel by getting him to stand as an ashtray at the door of a party. And so when people came into the party, they would stub their cigarettes out in the, in the palm of this guy's hand. But in return for that kind of sadomasochistic humiliation, Fassbinder would buy him a Rolls Royce because, you know, they're making a lot of money, etc., etc. So <laughs> I'm not saying that we ever got cigarettes stubbed out in their hands or ever got Rolls Royces, in fact. But there was that kind of dark psychological undercurrent going on as well. There was the drama that was happening on stage, but then there was also the drama that was happening off stage. And part of Peter's philosophy was very much one lot of drama informs the other lot of drama. He's a master manipulator, if you like, and I mean that in a positive sense. 
He has a strong ability to look at the core emotions that are affecting people, and he has been um, observed to go for the weak point, if you like, go for the point of vulnerability, and use that as a creative opportunity. It's confronting, uh, it's risky. Uh, that model in which the director confronts the actors and makes them do all sorts of things which are outside their comfort zone. Having to go into dark places that you don't, one would rather not go into in terms of one's personal life and one's personal psyche. But I found the direction quite challenging. I found, um, I found at times the things that I were being asked was a process for me of, of humility. And I sometimes wondered if Peter found the same humility as the director that shaped me for who I am now and the work I do now. And I think that I was able to cherish and honour my students in a way that I'd never been able to if I hadn't worked in the free theatre. Peter's uh, vision, I suppose, is quite uncompromising. But at the same time, he would say that it was uh, very flexible. But he, had, he most definitely had the desire, in a political and aesthetic sense, to change the way Christchurch theatre viewed itself. I've experienced this idea that theatre is, is playing around something that is separate from everyday real life, something that you really should maybe have fun with for a while and then grow up and go on and do something that's in the real world. And for me, the way that Peter directs us as actors in the theatre allows us to see, to experience acting as something much more truthful and not as pretending and as something um, that is just an escape from life, but actually is a way into life. The first production I did with Peter was a Kokoschka piece called Murder, A Hope of Woman, and that was sort of double billed with an Arto piece called The Philosopher's Stone. That was a really eye-opening experience to sort of, I guess, begin a, a conversation now that I've been having with Mr Falkenberg now for uh, over 10 years and along the way it is, each project has just been completely different. <laughs> but you know I was born in this world. My father, he already cheesed me. That, that's his hair. My young age queen. I think the first uh, free theatre production I saw must have been in the early 80s, which was um, Jerry's King Ubu. And the reason I saw that when I was just a little person is because my dad was an actor uh, with the free theatre. And um, after he separated from my mum, he used to bring me along on the weekends when they had rehearsals. And I used to sit in the back and I suppose do my colouring and so forth and watch the performances. So I kind of grew up with the free theatre as being my default standard idea of what theatre was. She herself has become a very fine actor. I'm always very proud when I see her. And I remember seeing her for the first time when she was in one of Peter's experimental works based upon uh, Medea material by a German playwright. And uh, I, the intensity of that young woman on the stage was scary. I like to work with um, artists that have already a kind of trajectory, a uh, direction, and then try to find how I can bring their, um, their obsession, their art, into what I'm doing. I'll give you an example. In one of our productions at Salome, Graham Bennett had sort of these big kind of structures, steel structures with mirror glasses. They were as high as a theatre is high, yeah? It consisted of revolving mirrors on iron frames that could be climbed on. And with the capacity to go through some of the, the spaces, uh, and, and they shifted in colour with various lights coming on them. And so the production was performed with us climbing up and down or sitting on these moving pieces of, of sculpture. I mean, something like that you can't imagine. You just, you know, you, you find people at work on something and then you uh, collaborate with these people and, and something interesting, something which uh, transcends the normal kind of um, conventional trajectories of, um, of your plans. And I, I love that, you know. They say that his feet are like the feet of an elephant. <laughs>
I played Herod, and the rest of the cast was great. Salome was the most gorgeous young student. And when it came to the Dance of the Seven Veils, she started off naked and then wrapped herself up as the thing went on. I will let fall for me. When I came to this country, one of the first things I saw was a production by Red Mole, and I thought, I'm at home. That was just the kind of theatre that I liked. And then Alan Branton and Red Mole disappeared to New York. But when I came back, I wanted to immediately get in contact with them again, and I offered him the role of crap. Memorable. What? Equinox. Equinox. Memorable Equinox. Farewell to Today, sound as a He wasn't easy to work with because he, he was never directed by anybody. <laughs> but um, we worked quite well together. <laughs> and then he surprised me with things as well, you know. He did create this together with me. Wells in the words. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, Peter Falkenberg has worked with a wide variety of contemporary writers, including Werner Fritsch, who is well known in Europe as a writer of avant-garde stage and radio plays and film. A friend of mine, Mr. Jörg Dreves, connected me with uh, Free Theatre and Peter Falkenberg, and there I discovered he was also Bavarian, as I am. And then we started uh, to uh, develop three plays I've written. Raise me for the summer rain. There's danger on the edge of town. That's Nico, Sphinx of Ice. It's uh, Enigma Amy Goering and it was Faust Kroma. Then the criminal assistant and the policeman beat me with thick truncheons from behind so that with each blow I fell forward and with full force fell on my face and head. I was astonished of the quality and the spirit of his theatre and I liked it immediately. It was a great time to see them working. It's also good to see the new production hereafter. On the one hand, is a high intellectual, and on the other hand, is a very practical, good director. And this combination is seldom, because even that the insights hereafter is full of of hints and hidden traces other directors wouldn't check. And Peter checks both and can practice it and put it on stage. In this very macho play, we needed a female voice. Yeah, to 
balance it in some way. And a female voice that not necessarily um, uh, works with words. Necess yeah. and that, that's a, a lovely piece in a, in a way because it's, it is so speaking, but it's just using gibberish doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work with rational uh, means, but it is so persuasive nevertheless, you know. <laughs> The night before his execution, he's there for murder. He's in a cell, and we are privy to his fantasies and his mind's wanderings. Pull the trigger! I'm not whining for my life. For your mercy, I shit on a life without quarter. You've snuffed out your perverted fucking pigs, and no goddamn pig will believe me anyway. Yeah, manslaughter. <laughs> manslaughter. Manslaughter of Cora. Increasingly, also, we in, in, introduce audiences into not just sitting in stable chairs, but we uh, do productions where we either meet our audiences by go performing in supermarkets or in town. You need a lot of cash to live in style. That's the message of this song. It says, don't try to live a simple life. Don't have ideals and dreams, but live in poverty. That's foolish. Don't try to live a daring and adventurous life. Don't, don't do things for no financial reward. That doesn't make sense in this society. Rather, that's what is actually missing the connection of body and soul in a Puritan tradition that is especially uh, difficult to achieve. And, uh, and in, in a way, Talking Heads Theatre is something which is much better done on television and other places. The kingdom of God can only be strengthened by war and the blood of its martyrs. And I say unto you clearly and definitively that Jesus gave the commandment, love your enemies, only for commerce between individuals, but not for relations between nations. Love is not for nations, gentle Jesus be praised. Put more steel into your blood. Put more steel into your blood. Some of our productions that are community centers, we actually don't even advertise as productions. One of them uh, was called Last Days of Mankind. And that's where, where I sent the actors for several months in white masks and suits to walk silently around town with certain kind of instructions. One of the instructions was they couldn't speak and they couldn't explain. Are you just doing this for entertainment? It was very interesting how the people reacted to that because they couldn't understand that people were doing things like that. So they had, without a reason. But then the actual production was a 24 hour piece, uh, it was a kind of occupation. The idea was actually that uh, New Zealand got his identity through wars, both uh, Pakeha and Māori, as warriors, and, uh, and questioning that idea and uh, having performances around that idea. They were basically looking for grunt soldiers, to <laughs> extras, if you will, to be a part of the production. Um, and so I got called up. Um, to be involved in that production, and it was a huge undertaking. We did 12-hour long performances um, from midday till midnight, um, three days in a row, and yeah, something about that whole experience, it was just unlike anything I'd ever done before, and caught me. Ki 
the occupied uh, places from the square uh, to and ended at the Bridge of Remembrance, performing and uh, exercising. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. Let the end is coming, the end is coming, the drums, drum, timing everywhere. Something which we uh, have done. In the past is worked together with Maori Natahu, a collaboration called Tapuai. We created this work that played with Wagnerian myth and music, juxtaposing it with Maori myth and music. We sort of experimented with Wagnerian motifs, and it was the first time I felt I could really just sing and just, you know, not have to sing the exact note that was written, but to sort of experiment with operatic music, and that was really exciting. The Māori contingent, they wrote their text and, and did their stuff, and he wrote our text and did our stuff. It was a kind of opera that was uh, very successful and, um, and led to, uh, you know, very interesting discussions afterwards. <laughs> The thing which was really neat for me was when I, when I looked around and, and saw the mixture of, of um, you know, stunned looks on people's faces and, and, and thrilled looks on people's faces in, in the audience. Um, you were part of the show, you were immersed in it. Um, Maori warriors were walking around and sneaking past you where you were seated. That immersive experience, um, the, 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 the juxtaposition of the two styles was so strong and so compelling. After the earthquake, where I, where I felt this theatre needed to go more, be become more a part of the community. So working together with the loads of other people, going into the community, in places in the community, and using a lot of music as well. It always has used music a lot, but it is now more musical theatre than ever. The work of the free theatre since the earthquakes looks like it's shifted its orientation, especially in relation to the way it works to and with and against the audience. So it's become, it looks like more cooperative and more collaborative than it was before. Though, I, you know, it still retains the edge it used to have. Gap Filler was started by Ryan Reynolds, myself and Andrew Just and Ryan and I are both from Free Theatre and we were really responding to what was going on in the city um, after the very first quake here and we could see vacant spaces appearing and we could see the city really quietening and dying and we really wanted to make use of the vacant spaces and for us it was all about how can we try something in a space, um, experiment, uh, involve people, bring an idea to life and that's um, very much how free theatre works. For me personally I'd probably have become more aware of the what the free theatre are doing post earthquake and that's not because they weren't visible at all. It's just that maybe I was doing other things. But I do think they have actually come and engaged with the cities post-earthquake in, in a really significant way. The first thing that I remember is the earthquake in Chile, which was an amazing performance of, and, and that involved other groups within the community. Those um, projects, I think, have been invaluable to this um, transitional phase of the city. Uh, uh, and I'm looking forward to tonight when they do the big parade. I've seen the puppets in construction and they look awesome. A band of volunteers working under the direction of designers Stuart Lloyd Harris, Richard Till and Chris Reddington have worked for many months on the construction of the giant puppets. I was a sculptor, that's my background mostly. I was employed as a maker. This kind of gave me a new way to think about space and things through my work as a sculptor. So to bring that into 
theatrical applications has been really useful for me. So I'm able to um, develop my understanding of space and just all the things that go on in a production to do with working with actors and to do with working with music and working under instruction from a director, um, bringing my own world into that. And because I'm a musician and a composer, and I often get called in to do the musical direct and di direction as well. So essentially we're bringing together art, performance, business, architecture and an integrated conversation about what, what, what the city could be. And the other thing is that we combine the whole city in light and sound. So there's a sense of integration. So people will move through and they'll both see, I guess, and feel the things that they remember, but also see something you know, new and different. I guess for free theatre it's an opportunity to um, actually show what we always do and have always done, which is um, to collaborate with a whole variety of people um, to create projects that engage with time and place. Uh, Canterbury Tales was planned a long time ago uh, when we were, had our uh, theatre and the art centre because we wanted to entertain the idea that the medieval, the new gothic art centre is something rather incongruous in the Pacific. We wanted to work with that. But after the earthquake, uh, at the moment the art centre is off limits, and uh, a lot of these um, medieval kind of uh, imitations have disappeared. So the Canterbury Tales is still engaging with the idea of crisis. Like uh, Chaucer's stories, the crisis in Chaucer's time was they had the plague, they had the uh, transition from feudalism into early capitalist structures. Here we have also a very transitional kind of uh, uh, position after the earthquakes. And we try to use uh, stories and characters from the Canterbury Tales to partly comment on or lampoon some of the characters that play a role in post-earthquake Christchurch. Last year, Lux City was a uh, basically launched the inaugural Festival of Transitional Architecture. And um, it brought in 20, 30,000 people into the city centre and it was a, the architectural schools from around the country collaborated with um, various businesses and organisations to create installations. And so Canterbury Tales is more or less building on that, uh, but very much with a view to engaging with a sense of place. We approached various performance groups from Christchurch to basically get these groups that have a sense of place here and get them to create Canterbury Tales stories that are about this place. And also the, the sites where we chose to create the project, the river, the cathedral, these are very much central places to how people actually come to be in this city. So, and, and to see the city as a performance. Oh, 
high five. Here. Oh, well. <laughs> I think Free Theatre has added a tremendous amount in so many ways to, to Christchurch, to be honest. If you look at the work that the Free Theatre has been doing over the last two years in particular, um, working in a very, very challenging post-earthquake environment in, in Christchurch where everything, social structures, buildings, everything has been upended in Christchurch. Free Theatre has been continuously working from the centre of the city, um, doing uh, a variety of, of different, different performances, but they're also running education programmes so from my perspective, it's both ends, getting, getting children and young people exposed to what free theatre does, um, its originality, its breadth, its depth, and also um, you know, expanding people's minds in Christchurch. It's been very exciting to return back to the Arts Centre because I guess it's, we see it as our home. Um, I mean, free theatre was started in 1979, but the original members built their own theatre in the Arts Centre in 1982. We have started very, which is very exciting, the first arts practice tenancy in the Arts Centre in what was formerly the Academy Cinema, um, but before that it was the Boys High Gym, so it's been stripped right back to the gym state, it's got a beautiful floor etc, and we've fitted it out with a light touch fit out which allows us to create all manner of contemporary performance with an onus on light and sound, and um, we've created a diversity of events that uh, for a new works and education program that's bringing in new audiences, that's creating new crossover work and it's, yeah, it's going wonderfully. When we moved into the gym, we wanted to have more regular performances in the space. So with our normal productions, we'll work for six to nine months, for example. And we'll have two major productions for a year, but we wanted in this space to have it open to the public more often and try out new things more regularly. The Urban Nights bring together the performance as well as the hospitality. Yeah, every audience is different depending on the theme. We had a Kafka Urban Night and we had a, the entire Czechoslovakian community, for example, you know, or we have the Velvet Underground Night, the Warhol Urban Night was another really popular one. Urban Nights are good night out where we explore a certain kind of theme. We had a Lynch Urban Night where all the actors dress up as figures, behave as figures of a certain kind of theme and behave like that all the night. And so the audience is, the, sometimes the audience come in dressed up as well. Uh, and that there will be lots of little performances, little music, there will be food that goes with the theme especially. <laughs> The uh, actors go around the tables and talk to people in in uh, roles. What's this guy doing? Okay, you get all sorts in the East Village. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. I think you look nice on the camera. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah. I don't care much about how I look these days, you know? Oh, yes, well, we make art here, you see. You do. Some of it's pretty shit, but oh, every yeah. now and then some of it's quite good. Yes, well, that's how it is. Tonight huh? you might be in luck. Yeah, yeah yes. I think so. Yes, it's groovy, man. Thank you, man. It's hip. Yeah, it is. It's salty and clean. Yeah. We definitely would like the Uber Nights to allow us to become finan more financially um, sustainable and it, also to be able to pay the actors at the moment. All, the, all of our, act, our time as actors and volunteers and bar staff and performers and band members, we're all you know, volunteering our time. And the idea is that through the Uber Nights, through the revenue generated by that, we'll be able to employ ourselves. And what a, what a great way to be able to live. It has been a major challenge for Free Theatre to get funding because we are an avant-garde company that's working at the margins and trying new things. But, you know, the, uh, a healthy and vibrant culture um, which 
we're trying to recreate or, 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 or create a new in Christchurch has to have a spectrum. The free theatre was, was and, and obviously continues to be really great at putting on fantastic spectacle on very little money, on the smell of an oily rag. The Mauricio Cargill Project is a new collaboration, a new music theatre collaboration, uh, directed by Peter Falkenberg. It's inspired by the works of Mauricio Cargill, with Chinese composer Gao Ping creating new works inspired by Cargill, especially for the piece. And uh, we work with conductor Hamish McKeach and essentially sees actors coming together with musicians to create a new hybrid form of music theatre. What I always feel about it is it has to be fun, but it does, that fun doesn't mean that it is necessarily not serious. So that's what I also said to uh, Gao Ping, I said, what I want is serious fun. He said, well, since you're Chinese, uh, you live in China, you, you know, you, your music is inspired by China, uh, perhaps it's appropriate to to incorporate Chinese elements into this thing, and especially uh, considering Cargo's um, attitude towards music. The Maurizio Cargo project was a combination of different pieces that uh, he uh, Cargo composed different theatre pieces and musical pieces that are brought together uh, in a sort of a melting pot. So that's, you know, that's also the, the interesting thing that we bring people together that normally don't work together. And we shouldn't be afraid of working in a way that we are not necessarily completely secure. But that, that's, the, that's the idea. That's the avant-garde. Cargill always said uh, he, why he was doing music all his life was because he wanted to find out, find out what it is. And, and she said, I never found out, but then perhaps I don't want to, because <laughs> I, want, I, want to, I want to search. It's such fun to search. You know? We have a set of, sort of exercises that are very physical, um, so we begin very much with the, with the body, which I guess is different perhaps from conventional theatre, which is often more um, related to um, you know, the text and to voices. And, but we very much work with the body and with the voice is something that you know, um, is related. One, two. <laughs> The first time I met Peter Falkenberg and the Free Theatre was with this uh, uh, Soldier's Tale of Stravinsky and they did a really great job. What I liked about them was that they, they were very easy to work with but Peter was always inventing things last minute to do and always changing. You know, it was a work, always a sort of a work in progress that he was sort of moulding and I liked what he did with the Soldier's Tale. It was quite uh, thinking outside the square. So when they sort of came to me with the Cargill project I was like, yeah, that um, could be very interesting and has proved to be. It's kind of free, okay. a box, you just repeat this kind of, but it doesn't have to be in this rhythm. Is it better the other way? I think it was for us. Yeah, and I think actually <laughs> there's a really, really close chance that these things are all going to get together like that. You're going to meet in the middle. Actors have been working with a series of Mauricio Cargill's pieces, which have all these wonderful sort of rules and playful ideas about how to play with the conventions between music and theatre. And one, for example, is contradance, which is a ballet for non-dancers, where he explicitly asks that the um, the performers be non-dancers and creates this movement to music. 
So that, so we do four out the front. One, That's what we did, two, right? anyway. Yeah. So what's different now? Yeah. 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 And then if you do make a mistake, just, it doesn't matter. It's okay, go carry on. I want to explore theatre in all its facets all the time. And uh, I had never done something which is just music. So I, I wanted to make a concert. Uh, which is which I can direct because yeah. yeah. I normally Sorry, find yeah. them very boring. The people sort of sit there and feel that they are sort of half asleep or they have to be very reverent and stuff like that. Uh, so I thought, yeah, that's perhaps not the only way man can uh, listen to music. And uh, perhaps this, the theatrical way that Kagel proposes is something which might loosen that up. start walking back to the next position. Because we rearranged the, the transitions completely for the first part. Can we really not just have it laid out like this? This work cannot survive without the geometry of the yeah, fender okay. gods. It can't, it's just budget. It's a set designer's uh, it's just me disrupt his ideas for the whole What thing. do you think, Stuart, if we had this left out for the entire performance? Get a hundred people in here, they'll just kick this stuff all over the floor. Please contact stand 314 in... Well, maybe you do me this a little bit. Like when oh, the repertoire, we actually get like three, four minutes, then we should like move, I think. So we like each do like one movement or something through the but, space. But you know, you just have to see if audiences are there, yeah. gather there. They're free, I would say, and I like that. It's basically, uh, there's a Chinese idiom um, that says, um, touching the stones and cross the river. So you are <laughs> trying every step, make sure that you don't fall into some, or maybe you want to fall in there. Um, so it's uh, finding out what's possible, not necessarily always with a very clear Go or even idea exactly how it should be, but just try out things and see the possibilities. I guess free theater does that uh, um, with uh, a lot of courage, yeah, um, and I really like that. <laughs> This is only 3,000. <laughs> Mr. Elbeck Ostradikov, Mr. Sir Chosu. Zhang Lixin, sir. Please Und Frau Feuchtwanger, bitte kontaktieren Sie sofort Hanna. That was Exotica number one by Mauricio Cargill.
that was Elegy by Gao Ping. Actually, a, a very long-living experimental theater, even in in uh, universal terms, <laughs> because uh, normally experimental theaters, uh, you know, die after a few years, uh, and we have had many recurring uh, groups of actors and and collaborators and writers uh, that have gone out into yeah into other jobs and so on. In general, it's quite conservative this town and um, people's tastes for things are rather conservative. So uh, free theater being in Christchurch is quite appropriate because it seemed to need that kind of energy. And I think some people really appreciate it. Maybe uh, some others see it differently. And I think it's uh, fantastic that they're here and um, doing it throughout all these years, 37 years or something, that's remarkable. Things have changed, and so has the theater, but the theater that we do has always something to do with the time and the place we are just in now. And I can't really make any pronouncement that something is better or not so good. It is, if it's alive, it is, it is alive. A lot of people who were absolutely disgusted by what I was doing, they developed a kind of aggression and hatred against this, and often they didn't even see the work. But it's, it, it created its own kind of, of aura of gossip or of, whatever it is, so the best way to fight against this work for these people was to make it invisible. And in some ways, I think the work is still invisible. And perhaps what you are trying to do is to make it less invisible. <laughs> 